The following was recorded during the COVID-19 pandemic through Zoom meetings in accordance with local health guidelines. All right, welcome to the Ministry Misfits podcast. This is episode one. This is our pilot episode. I am your host, Andrew Fouts. Joining me today is our executive producer, the one and only sports ministry apologist, Greg Linville. Um, and we're here today to introduce um, this podcast, talk a little bit about why we're doing it, how we're going to do it, and then also introduce our first guest, um, which is one of my favorite people in all of the world and one of our favorite people within CSRM in general. Um, so Dr. Linville, welcome. And you get to beat out our first guest as being the first guest. So congratulations. <laughs> well, I'm excited about this ministry misfit concept and how it is fulfilling our vision to grow our overwhelming victory radio. And if you're just kind of joining us, we've had overwhelming victory Flicks, and that was a place where we did our podcasts and our Tuesday talks and go to some of our previous podcasts and you can find out about that. And I'm sure it's coming up on the screen how you can get in touch with that. They're all archived. But we've, we've had a vision for this OVR, Overwhelming Victory Radio, in the sense that we know that there are specifics within the local church sports minister's life that needs a little extra something. It's not just about how to run a league, but how do I balance my family and my marriage? How, how do I how do I deal with some of these trends that are out there? How do I stay healthy? How do I whatever? And we've got a very, very unique and exciting thing here in what we are calling now this ministry that Andrew's doing about ministry misfits. And I think the first one that's so appropriate is with Bradley Barnes. We, we recognize that we have a bit of a, we, we fall short a little bit because we're American. We, we are Western. And that we, we just bring those biases and cultures with us. And sometimes we are not as sensitive as we should be to some other areas. And what works in America is not gonna work necessarily in New Zealand or Nepal or other places. And so as part of our transition to the future, I am so excited that we have been involved with Bradley Barnes for a number of years now. Bradley started as a global network partner with CSRM. That means he was a glorified volunteer uh, he had some very specific things he had the hoops he had to jump through and do and he's proved trustworthy at every step of the way he went on staff that means that whereas he was volunteering his time now he gets paid most months you can support him go to our website please support support him, support yes. him financially he and his family they're doing a great ministry and then so well did he do there that we said, he's a leader, and he's now our continental director of, of the whole of Africa. And so even though he's based in South Africa, he is overseeing and he's training scores and scores of people throughout that, not just country, but that whole continent. And so part of what we're doing is that we're, Bradley is going to be the first of our OVR to be pioneering their own and we've got it we haven't named it yet it might be something like forum fridays friday forums kind of like our tuesday talks taking on some of those major issues that africa faces also the podcasts that are more geared to specific things not so broad ranging so to speak it may not but, even be in english <laughs> there, well, there you have it. And so and, we're trying to make it as relevant as it can be. And, and part of what, and this is going to be something that hopefully uh, those of you that are going to become regular listeners to this um, will, will see is that even though we're, we, 
you know, we're talking about things going on in South Africa, things that have gone on in South Africa in today's episodes, you know, they're different from the U.S., so they don't apply. We want to break everything down into the three-tier paradigm and look at everything as far as this is what Scripture says on the matter. This is what we do with it, and then this is how we as ministers, um, whether that's sports ministers, youth ministers, pastors, whatever you are, you are going to be able to take it and apply it in your church and in your ministry and be able to impact your community, whether that's here in the U S or that's in South Africa with Bradley or, um, you know, anywhere else in the world. We, we have a lot of international partners and hopefully we're going to be able to hear a lot of their stories, a lot of their impact between, um, you know, the CSRM podcast that kind of fathered this one. Um, as well as through this podcast, which is the Ministry Misfit podcast. So we're going to jump into Bradley's interview here. Um, Dr. Limbo will be back with us for a few episodes, and we're going to dive deeper into all of this. Um, but we've got a quick, quick break here, and then we'll jump right into Bradley. So we are here with Bradley Barnes. Bradley is the CSRM director of the African continent or continental director, or I don't remember exactly what we've titled you, but he's in charge of the big continent. Um, so Bradley is here because we're going to talk today about some historical world history stuff, um, both in his own personal life, as well as in his ministry life. And then we want to kind of break it down and apply it to what we're seeing here in the U.S. specifically right now, but then also in a much more broad how the church should actually approach some of these things. So, Bradley, you are in Cape Town, South Africa, correct? That's correct, yeah, Andrew. And you've, you were born, raised, stayed there pretty much your whole life. So uh, tell us a little bit about your uh life growing up as far as the situation, um, you know, things like that. How, give us the, uh, the picture of who Bradley Barnes is. Okay. I, uh, I can give you the picture of who I was, um, forced to be and probably to, uh, I want to be and who I should be now. Um, but about 42 years ago, born in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, then, born into a, an apartheid system um, that I had no idea of. Growing up, you grow up with a child mindset and you look beyond borders or restrictions of where you should go or what you can say and to who you can say. So um, because of my skin color, um, my family's skin color is um, more like you Americans, very light, <laughs> like yours, Andrew. I, I'm, I'm the only grandchild that is this dark-skinned. Um, so growing up, born in Cape Town, South Africa, I, I did not have a clue what I'm walking into in, in Cape Town specifically. Um, Cape Town was very much um, the focal point of the 1976 riots where all the students stood up against the then government and, and the police force um, when we were forced to be removed from a place called Samstown to now a community called Ocean View, which was just a little bush um, that was cleared up and houses, shacks were built. Um, then... In the time of my upbringing, it was, I was always asking myself, why are we not able to go to the beach, which is about one and a half miles away from our, our community? And I was never told because in our culture, it's a, you don't ask questions, especially when it's at that time when, when I, I, I hate to use the word, but um, that's the only word I can think of now, but when the when a white person lays down the law in South Africa um, at that time, um, you do not question that, though. Um, now, and real, I question that. 
real quick for uh, for some people that may not know world history, which is part of why we're doing this, is to kind of broaden the focus out. So, okay. 1976, South Africa. Who was who was in charge at that time? Oh, at the time, it was the white regime that was in charge, um, and it was a time when um, Nelson Mandela was put in jail as well, and so it was more the white dominant um, government um, that was in charge at that time. Yeah, so if, if you're not aware, um, you know, Cape Town especially, but South Africa as a whole was at one point a British um, settlement. Um, and so this has kind of been really, I would say even more so than the U.S., really the heart of the whole racial reconciliation issue. Um, you know, the, the, the white British coming into the actual African continent and setting up shot, shop. And we've got this big paradigm. The British really were kind of out of the picture by the time you were there. But, um, you know, we, what, what Bradley's talking about is you literally had a all white government that was Correct. ruling over. And even though they were probably born and raised South Africans, it still was really a, culturally di diversive and really a foreign power was kind of in charge. Would that be accurate? Very much accurate. And I think for Cape Town, it's been, it was actually more confusing because we had, we had the British um, Navy government that was ruling in Cape Town, but then we also had the Dutch influence mm -hmm. and, and our, and our history in Cape Town specifically um, we we have the understanding that it was the Dutch more than the British that that um, brought influence to Cape Town, um, and hence we speak a, a a language called Afrikaans, which is ironically it, it's the white farmer's language, but but it originates from the Dutch language though. Yeah, and how and you speak you personally speak three or four languages. Yeah, I I speak English, Afrikaans, um, and I speak Xhosa, which is our native national language, and then also um, we speak Zulu, um, which is on the east coast of South Africa, mm -hmm. which is more like the, the Zulu clan, the, the Zulu tribes. Um, that's the dominant languages in South Africa. Yeah, so... Back to your story, you're you're a young kid that really has no clue what's going on, even though you've you know been living there your whole life, yeah. and you you were talking about you've got the white regime in charge, and you're not supposed to ask questions in general culturally, but especially a darker skinned male to the white superiors. How how did this questioning process turn out? Well, this was. This set me up for a lot of um, beatings, a lot of um, pushing and shoving away from what I will share later with you in my school career. But it, um, being the dark skinned guy was often seen as I'm looked at in a negative light because of my skin color. So the white regime or the white folk in South Africa would obviously have the mindset before even meeting me or greeting me that I am trouble. And I recall a time when um, we were obviously not allowed to go to the white beaches in, in, in our, in Cape Town, or well, in South Africa. And um, we went through this, this farm where we were um, thrown into, which was ocean, it's called Imo Farm. The farm is still um, active today. Um, but you had to walk through the farm to get to the beach and the white farmer would use rubber bullets to shoot at us while we try and journey to the beach or let his dogs loose, um, his wild dogs loose. So we took the gamble and hence there's a joke going around in South Africa that Cape Tonians are very fast runners But um, and we joke and our response is yes because in the partages we were running away from the white man's farmer's animals to try and stay alive to go, go take a swim so you uh even and, and this is something that culturally 
may not be very well understood, at least from the white American perspective in general, but um, even talking with some white evangelical Christians in general, the Christian perspective on this whole thing, you know, you were never in a slavery type setting, but yet the, the racial prejudice, the racial tone, the racial, um, you know, violence in a lot of cases is still there. So let's, let's move forward. You, you know, you, you are a very, um, you know, special, unique person, even within South African history, um, because you kind of were one of the first ones to be able to start breaking through some of those barriers, bridging that gap a little bit as, as a child, um, as a, as a student, talk a little bit about your, your school experience. Yeah, well, um, God really blessed me with the sporting ability um, where I could play any sporting code. So my my grandmother was working for a white lady cleaning a house as a housekeeper. And the white lady got me into a white school in Simonstown on a sports scholarship. And it was in that next five years where I was kind of one of the front runners um, at the school um, as a student representative council for the non-whites, um, where we were forcing um, non-white sports. And when I talk non-white sports, in that time, soccer or football, what it's called, um, was not allowed in the white schools. And here you have somebody like me that at that time I was representing the state, what we would call province and also national um, team through soccer and I was not able to play that at the school but getting into that school during that time as a as you were saying that I was one of the first to bring influence um, I have to share with you that my first two years at the white school called Simonstown High um, I was not allowed into the classroom I was the only black kid non-white kid at the in the entire school and we would line up like the old British military way outside each classroom for each subject. So you would walk from class to class through different subjects. And I would hide in the middle of the, of the boys row. I would stand in front. I would stand at the back. Um, but they would just not let me into the school. And it took me two solid years of not being able to get into a class. But I was, I was given the opportunity to write the exam. And lo and behold, I passed that exam um, through something that, I don't know, God just laid him out. There was a white guy, Jason, that was absolutely crazy over the, at that time, non-white sport, which was soccer. Um, so he had no clue about playing soccer. Um, when the school bell rang for the end of the day, I would use an hour to teach him to play soccer. And the next hour I would use to write down the day's work. And that is how I got through the exams for the two years crazy awesome so this is where from the csrm perspective we stop and say this is why sports ministry is such a big deal and why it needs to be embraced <laughs> um but even beyond that this is something again we're you know we're trying to open people's eyes a little bit with with your story you know you're you're talking about not just a segregated schooling but very much a you were there kind of in more of a political fashion of saying, look, we've got him here, but still not allowed even into the classrooms. Um, you know, even your sports were still in segregated, but this was not that long ago, historically speaking, because this would be, this would be what, what year, not trying to age you or anything like that, but <laughs> yeah. this would have been 19, 1970s, 1980s. Yeah, it would be late eighties. So, so it would be a time where, where um, it was about, it was like a trial run in South Africa where um, the white schools were letting in only non-whites that were recommended. And it was a time when there was a lot of tension because the, you need to understand in South Africa, we can talk about whites, but then it's also split into two. You have the white farmers who are more, um, influence through the Dutch and then you have what you'd call the, the European whites which is influenced by the British and even up until today in South Africa there's a, there's a clear 
um, line that is still kept between those two. And people often talk about the black-white racial tension, but, but there's quite a few, um, what we would say, the white tension between the farmer and, and the, the British person. So I came into that process at the school time where the white farmer was saying, okay, no, let's, let's give them a chance. You know, let's give this non-whites a chance. And the, the British whites were saying, no. And, and, and because the farmer was the local person, um, of influence in the country at that time because of produce, um, they went in that favor of, okay, letting kids get into our schools first. Let's, let's not give um, access to adults, but let's give access to kids. And the only way that could happen is if the kid had an ability to play sports. And it's amazing how sports, um, and that's why I'm so passionate about sports ministry, it's amazing how the tool of sports um, can break so many barriers and also build bridges, though. Yeah, and that's actually what um, I was in ALB on. I think, did you make it to the, the last Tuesday talk um, this week? Yeah, yes, I yeah, did. We, I, I, um, I came on. Yeah, so CSRM has the Tuesday Talks, which is also a podcast here through the OV Radio Network. Um, you can find it you know, on the list um, and on the OV Facebook page, but that's what the February, 2021 topic was on this idea of racial reconciliation. Um, and in particular how sports and sports ministry can really be the, the driving force behind it. But one thing you said that, um, stuck out and that I think maybe we can unpack a little bit more before we, we keep on with your story is this idea of, you know, there was the black white divide, which is what, you know, we, at least here in the U S gets focused on a lot, but yeah. there was another divide as well between the, the white farmers and then, you know, the white Dutch and all that kind of stuff. And I think this is a good place to talk about the difference between ethnicity and actual racial tension and how ethnic ethnic tension seems to actually be the driving force behind a lot of this and how much culture itself actually is what plays a role um is that kind of what you you've experienced um because you've even said you know you're a lighter skinned um you know non-white person but yet you've still experienced the full range of what it means both to be non-white and also to be lighter skinned absolutely and and it's still something that that plays out in 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 the business sector in South Africa, and also honestly and sad to say in the church um, setting as well though, um, and I'll get into that and, and share examples in a later stage, but um, with, the, with the split in, with the racial at the time is that um, us, what we, we call ourselves coloreds, which is the Cape Malay, so we, we don't get classified as black in South Africa. We don't get classified as white in South Africa. We're kind of in between. <laughs> That's what they're saying. Um, so they, they've used the term Cape, which is from Cape Town. So pr predominantly people from, from Cape Town are what they would say colored people, Cape Malay people. And they kind of got the Cape Malay wrong because they – they use the word Cape because we're from Cape Town and then Malay because of the Malaysian influence. But it was more a, we have a strong Dutch influence. So we were caught not just in the middle of the black and white, but we were caught in the middle of the white and the white as well. Um, because we were favored by the Dutch regime, which was the farmer, the white farmer. And, and we were not in favor by the um, British influence, which was the white, what we would say the the white working class sector at that time. So so it did not just bring a split between black and white. It actually brought a, a, a split within our culture as well because some would go the white influence of the of the Dutch and some would go the influence of the the British. And that that's something that is that one that's definitely more unique to the South African sector but that's something that as just a concept is is missed a lot of times in these kind of conversations is this idea of the you know uh, 
you know, from a scriptural perspective, the whole idea of, you know, we see the outside, but God sees the heart of the issue, you know, just because, you know, you, this person has this type of skin color, it's assumed that they come from this cultural background, when in reality, that may not be the case (laughs) at all. Um, You know, with, within current events within the U.S., you know, we've got that tension that's not talked about. There is a white on white tension. There is a black on black tension um, throughout the, you know, reconstructive period here in the U.S., which was the period after the Civil War. You had the whole Mm -hmm. concept of Uncle Tom. You had the whole concept of, um, you know, the the slavery sympathizers, you had some that were the abolition sympathizers, you know, all this kind of stuff where the, the skin was used as the example. And unfortunately in some cases that was what became the main focus, but what really started the process was more about cultural differences and maintaining power. And I think that's something that the church has to start with is this idea. And you already talked about the fact this is not just a business finance politics thing, but this is a big issue within the church, especially of the, the power struggle and the idolatry that really is behind a lot of these racial tensions has to be addressed first before we can even start looking at reconciliation. Absolutely. Andrew, um, I've, I've experienced this the setup in the church um, 2010 when the Lord laid on my heart to use sports as a tool to share the gospel through church as well. Let me tell you quickly, I, I went to all white churches just because they were um, the churches of influence where most people were going to. And I said, look, this is what God has laid on my heart. You know, are you guys interested in me equipping you and, and training you up? And lo and behold, um, doors were thrown in my face. I got spat on in my face. Um, people were saying that I'm, my work that I want to do is from the devil. And um, I did a simple scenario um, during the, the World Cup even in 2010. My, what, I would, what we would talk about now is my white friend, was a pastor, took the exact same invite, exact wording, did not even change my name, um, did not put his name on the invite, but changed the photo. So he took my black face out, put his white face in, and 70% of the churches said, yes, come. Um, so I, I've personally experienced that, and I'm still experiencing that in some provinces, what, we, what you would call states in South Africa, where there's a still strong British influence where um, people are still not open to non-whites um, equipping the churches though or, or the leaders. And that that's something that, you know, before any uh, American listeners, um, hopefully you're listening, this is our first uh, recording. Congratulations, you're my first person on here. So hopefully people are listening. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, before we, we get the whole high and mighty, oh, well, look how much better we are here. This is not a... Uh, this isn't even a South African issue. This is a global issue within the church because, you know, even me as a white pastor, um, when my wife and I went and started talking to a couple different church planning organizations about potentially planning a multicultural church within a black, low, low class, low low economic neighborhood, the response kept coming back was, well, why would you want to go there? There's no money there. There's, you know, why would you want to waste your time going there? And our response giving, because there are people there, (laughs) you know, there are people there. And even the church that we are currently um, attending, that's third street community, which um, CSRM podcast listeners, you probably recognize that name. We've had them on quite a bit. You know, it was the same process of, they finally found a group of people that were willing to support them going into the, you know, the black neighborhoods as a white family and being able to um, plant a church and using that multicultural model and preaching racial reconciliation and, you know, the gospel of, of, you know, Christ for all at that point, finally they were able to plant and they've been successful in that. Um, So that's not a, uh, that's definitely not a, 
African or an American thing. That is a global church problem that really, I mean, stems back all the way to the book of Acts. I mean, we saw that with, we see that with Paul and Peter going at it about the Jews and the Gentiles. Um, that's something that still 2000 years later, we seem to have a little bit of a struggle navigating. So this was part one of our interview with Bradley Barnes. Bradley will be back next week as we continue through his story, specifically addressing how um, the church specifically led the racial reconciliation efforts there in South Africa, um, as well as how things have developed since then and how this all actually applies to us here in the United States, especially from a ministry perspective. Um, Dr. Linville will also be back there at the beginning to help us continue to start to introduce some of these different things that we're going to be using on this podcast to evaluate different situa situations and events, as well as, um, you know, talk about some of the different things that we're going to be discussing in, in interviews and things like that. So we hope that you'll come back next week. Um, if you haven't already, go ahead and like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube. We're hoping to be up and running on all major platforms here soon as far as audio podcasting as well. So stay tuned wherever you typically listen to your podcasts and we will see you then. The Ministry Misfits podcast is a production of Overwhelming Victory Flicks, Overwhelming Victory Radio, and Ministry Misfit Media. Dr. Greg Linville and Andrew Fouts are our executive producers. Our theme music is entitled Rain and provided by Morning Light Music. For more information about Overwhelming Victory, visit overwhelmingvictory.org. For more information on CSRM, visit csrm.org. If you are interested in listening to our sister podcasts on the Overwhelming Victory Radio Network, visit overwhelmingvictory.org backslash ovradio. If you're interested in contacting Ministry Misfit Media or have your own story to share, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Ministry Misfit or email us at ministrymisfitmedia at gmail.com.